Welcome to hour number two on a Monday with Hashtag Daily K's host, Peter Big. Tired of just scratching the surface of Korea? Want to get deep in the weeds? We unpack everything about Korea through its history on Now and Then with David. It is a Monday, so you know what that means. Now and then with David Tizard in the studio to make history incredibly interesting and fun like it should be. Unless you had a rubbish history teacher. I'm not looking at you, Mr. Alton. Uh, How are you doing, David? You look very smart. Thank you very much. I was a bit worried there. You said David's in the studio to make history. And I thought you were going to stop there. (laughs) But then you said to make history fun. And I was like, okay, I can do that. You can make history if you want. (laughs) Let's let's do something. Let's do a first. <laughs> on Huddy Young Radio, who knows? Uh, how have you been doing since we last saw you, sir? I've been doing excellent. You know, I'm uh, trying to stay humble, but my, my writing, my reading, mm. everything's going well. Oh, I'm nice. getting stuck into all the academic things that I should be. I'm being disciplined in all of those stuff. Y- you've got a book in the pipeline, right? Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> got to be finished by August. Okay, um, that's it's the already, deadline, yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how's that going? It's it's not going bad, but there, there's many books I want to write. So oh, wow. It's, um, the you know, first of many. This this might be the first one, and I've, yeah. So lots that I'm doing. Wow. Yeah. What Can you, like, uh, reveal the general theme of that book, like what oh, it's tackling? This, this first book is yeah. my, um, my PA, PhD dissertation oh. and a publisher reached out to me and said we want you to turn this into a book oh nice and so it's having to revisit it but to make it readable because nobody wants to read a PhD sure. dissertation <laughs> and it's been a couple of years since I've been there doing that because you know uh-huh. I've been all over the culture sure. and, and Hallyu and politics doing all these things so I've got to get that book done mm-hmm. and then I want to write my next book which is already I've already started oh and, wow yeah, so, you know, I'm keeping busy. Many and I, I'm enjoying it and I'm, I'm thankful for all the opportunities and privileges I get. The uh, the president of the Korea Times uh-huh. was messaging me <gasps> this morning Wow! Uh, on the way here. I, I know him quite well. Uh-huh. Um, you write for them, right? I write for them every week, yeah. a column every week. And he was uh, saying that your columns these days are... Hitting doing well, apart. doing oh, well. Fantastic. So. I love them. They're always issues that maybe, you know, you won't get to hear in many other parts of career and then a real deep dive into those as well. Mm. That's why we get to pick your brain here. I love it. Uh, today's topic. I don't know if we've done this. <clears throat> we are. Oh, we maybe talked about Big Hit, did we? No, we did. No. BTS. Ah, BTS. Okie dokie. Yes. Permission to dance. But the entertainment agency in itself, I'm, I'm guessing we're going to look at one of the founder or the founder as well in a bit of detail this might be a first right on well, now and then lots of firsts i yeah. like doing lots of firsts so we've been we've done some korean philosophy recently we, we you know we're doing individuals not just parts of history mm. but i want to look at today sm entertainment oh because without sm entertainment one of the biggest yes k-pop agencies I, I think it stands to reason without SM, you don't get BTS. Mm. You, you certainly don't get ESPA. Uh, you don't get NCT. You don't get 17. SM have not only contributed to K-pop as it is, but some might argue that the current K-pop system, mm. uh, the way trainees, uh, the way music is produced and put out, it owes so much to yeah. SM Entertainment. And I think, you know, when I came here in 2008, it was talked about like the big three, SM, JYP, YG. Mm. And out of them, I think it's safe to say that SM are the ones who are still kind of hitting it out the park much more than maybe JYP and, and YG. You know, YG have gone through a bit of controversy and JYP, I just don't hear about them so much. Maybe their artists are still relatively popular. Yeah, my... my I don't know if I can say this, my JYP <laughs> stocks are still going up. Oh, yeah, nice. They're doing all right. Oh. Everything else is going down, but Business go wise. JYP. <laughs> okay. but, but I chose SM today. What a good boy good. I am. Yes. Yeah, this, is not, this is not promotion. But <laughs> if you're talking about that time, and we will come to the history, but around that time, the, the early to like 2005, 2010, that's where SM were just on top of the world mm. and K-pop equaled SM. So like just looking at SM entertainment, um, Bernie Cho, ex-MTV executive, well-known in the industry here, he says that SM was the first Korean label to make K-pop bands as as brands. They're they're not just kind of musicians, but Uh they're something bigger. There's something in which you have 
fans and performances and colors and merchandise and all of that that we associate with K-pop today starts with SM and uh, and what they did with it. Now, last year, just to give you some data. SM's revenue is growing, so they're still getting bigger. That they're up nearly 20% percent wow. in terms of money they made uh, from 2021 to 2022. Mm. They've got like. Hundreds of thousands of applicants in multiple countries mm. every year trying to get in to SM Entertainment. Now I looked at this data. This is a little bit old. This was this data is about five years old, mm. but it said that its YouTube page gets 1,000 views a second. Oh my goodness, that's crazy, isn't <laughs> it's, it? It's huge. Yeah, um, SM are just like that. This is a global phenomenon, right? Yeah. Not restricted to Korea at all, because many of our listeners. I'd say they shout out the most to SM Entertainment rather than other agencies. We've got lots of fans of lots of their artists. Boa was recently doing her 20th yeah. anniversary stuff, and yeah. so many of our listeners were on board with that yeah. and saying it's great to see her. And she, you know, represented SM in a lot of those early audition shows, right? She was kind of their face as well. Yeah, yeah. Lots to say about Boa. Yeah. Before we, before we speak about Boa, I'm not sure how much time we have. Let's take a look at the man behind SM mm. Entertainment, Lee Soo-man. Okay. Now, Lee Soo-man, you see some pictures. These are his album covers when he was an aspiring musician himself. Wow. So we normally associate... Isuman with being a businessman, the man behind everything. <laughs> but he had visions of his own career in music. He tried to do it, but the the stories say that he found in Korea at the time the censorship, oh. the environment. It wasn't to his liking. Okay. It didn't really work. And so what he did is he went off to the United States, did a master's degree in computer engineering at <laughs> California State University, okay. which perhaps explains all the ESPER and mm, NCT maybe, stuff that yeah. comes later. <laughs> But while he was there, he was there during the, the launch of MTV. Oh, wow, he back saw, in the 80s. Yeah, he oh. saw MTV coming. He saw the music videos of Michael Jackson uh-huh. in particular. And he realized that it wasn't just about music, but there was this visual thing going mm. on. And so inspired by all of that, he eventually came back to Korea in 1985 and he was determined to do what something of what he'd seen in the United States. So again, there's that influence, that international, uh-huh. cosmopolitan mixing of cultures is so important for K-pop. Yeah, we got a photo of him, like, maybe back in the 80s, starting out. And yet, to be honest, a lot of people who were successful in that kind of period in music, on the edgier side, had got influence, or maybe had studied abroad or done something yeah. like that, and then brought that back here. Wow. And so, what, does he... get some artists under his belt then? Yeah, just to say one thing about that, I'm sure the listeners will have remembered me saying, because they're such good historians, but mm-hmm. I'm sure the listeners will remember me saying that Koreans weren't freely allowed to travel abroad until mm. January the 1st, 1989. Yes. So although Lee Soo-man went abroad, that's because he was doing graduate study. Mm-hmm. The average South Korean was not going abroad. They yeah. didn't have access really to Japanese culture. That was banned until the early 2000s mm. here, cultural products. And so... The international stuff seemed really new. Yeah. It seemed really visionary. So he came back. You saw him being a, uh, a radio DJ. And then oh. in the early 90s, he's, he debuted his first artist. And at this time, it was still called SM Studio. Uh-huh. And he debuted Hyun Jin Young. Now, Hyun Jin Young came out in 1990. This uh-huh. is two years before s o t e j i And this was trying to bring hip hop To South Korea. <laughs> Now, Hyun Jin Young, he passed an audition for Lee Soo Man. And do you know how he did it? Because he pulled off the t o k i t u m He pulled off the rabbit dance. <laughs> the rabbit dance being, it's kind of like that MC Hammer one. You know that running man okay. thing that you do on the spot? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hyun Jin Young does that. Uh, Lee Soo Man puts him out there. He's going to be like this new hip hop book. Korea wasn't really ready for it. Mm. You know, when s o t e j i came out a couple of years later, yeah. Korea was ready for s o t e j i It was exactly what the country needed. But Hyun Jin Young was perhaps a little bit too early. Uh-huh. And then his, his career sort of, you know, a, a series of drug convictions for Hyun Jin Young oh, no. uh, meant that, you know, there was, there was marijuana, there was methamphetamines. It was just scandal after scandal. And I say that because it's really important that Lee Soo Man's first artist that he launched... Mm. got embroiled in a load of scandals. Yeah. And obviously that's something he's going to want to avoid because if you invest all that money in an artist mm. and then you get all these, these problems, yeah. you lose your money. He learned that very early on. And I think 
isn't it kind of known in the industry that they're quite good for their artists being relatively controversy free these days? <laughs> I mean, as much as that is possible in this day and age. Yeah. Welcome to Arirang Radio. If you are in Jeju, 88.7 in Jeju City. 88.1 in Sogipu City. 101.9 in the Daejeon area. Lots of messages from our listeners. Uh, Rao saying, basically, I feel now that HYBE is SM. Like, HYBE is the SM of today. Mm. Uh, sadly for me, he says. But maybe it's a bit more complicated than that. I guess it is impossible to have success with all of your projects. Yeah, yeah I don't think there's an agency out there that has a 100% success rate. I would, right? I'd be interesting to hear. That was Raul. Yeah. yeah. What Raul thinks connects SM and and hype. Mm. What is it, the qualities that SM perhaps used to have or SM are known for that you think hype are um, demonstrating yeah. today? Where are those things? Uh, or is it just like an instinctual thing? Leon, perhaps, maybe if I ever take a week off, Leon will come and sit in this seat because <laughs> Leon seems to know everything about <laughs> SM, talking about some of the groups that were perhaps not as well known, Trax and The Grace, Isaac and Dion, mm. um, also about the original TVXQ and how they had five members. And yep. sometimes history is change to only focus on on the strengths or the successes but yeah you need all of them they're, they're all in there sometimes we run out of time and we focus on a uh, uh on some but i'm sure isu man has has got them all in his head somewhere <laughs> i'm sure yeah uh, and siska saying i've watched some vlogs about sm entertainment and the history there it's still a little confusing and aim leads saying many musicians have covered that song by hyun jin yong okay i have heard those that did sound totally totally uh, retro and uh, nian saying hybe's business strategy in sm to me seems pretty different though yeah, mm. I'm, I'm guessing in this day and age hybe compared to sm way back when decades ago must be different so we're talking about sm studio at mm. that time yep where next what happens well it becomes sn entertainment uh 1995 there's a ceo uh put into place now hyun jin yong we we said that he had some problems although relative success mm. and from 1992 to 1996 you have sotaeji yeah. you have sotaeji and boys and they just they're just amazing they're, yeah. they're so big in korea it's hard to put into words how big their influence were the girls all wanted to date them. The boys all <laughs> wanted to be them. Sotaji was just incredibly big here. However, with Sotaji, there was also these stories that he was banned from certain television things because mm. of his appearance. He had yeah. ripped jeans. He had <laughs> earrings. Uh, he had red dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. And the, the television company said, you can't do that on television. Uh, some of his lyrics were banned because he was criticizing the government. And so... Because of these, Isuman decided that we need our artists to be more regulated. Ah. Why are we going to spend all of this money training some people if then they're banned from television, mm. if then they can't release their albums, if then they're in jail? Yeah. And so I think that becomes really important that it was about creating a system, not only to achieve amazing music, dances and, and performances, mm. that's one side, but you also have the other side, which is to eradicate problems and controversies so ah. the the training system is not just about dancing and singing but it's also about behavior relationships media training interviews ah. uh, and so that's what isuman brings to k-pop and that's what we associate it with it today right yeah but that that, that wasn't there before isuman so yeah i i don't know maybe if you're a purist a pure like music buff you might say oh that's not what music's about it's supposed to be about the art and being free and blah 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 <laughs> yeah i like the way you say that <laughs> <laughs> but i i guess from a business standpoint that's really kind of making your success making yeah. that path to success much easier right absolutely and so with that in mind um isuman it, it's got sm entertainment is put in this training system 1996, the first boy band to come out of the, we call it the SM uh, stable, would be H.O.T. Oh, and wow. this starts <laughs> off SM's upbeat, catchy style of dance music. It's not folk, it's not rock, it's not sort of hip hop, but it's just that 
that infectious visual, <laughs> very visual, mm -hmm. very cute, very in your face pop. And and H O T, if you know anything about K pop, they just make it this huge impact into the Korean music scene. Yeah. So after Sote G and the boys, it was H O T and then G O D and then which were you a bigger fan? And yeah. That kind of absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. But yeah, it was all about their visuals and their costumes on stage and their dances and whatnot. And But I love I love going back and looking at all these pictures, the hairstyles and the fashions and i like seeing which things are still similar and which uh -huh. things are different you know a lot of those poses might still carry across and, yeah and that lineup it's just the hairstyles are a little bit different you change the hair and i think you've got k-pop today and this is what it's really important sm isuman was introducing at that time mm. but perhaps even bigger than hot was their first girl group that comes out when mm. ses comes out their, their first album sells 600,000 copies they just become they're called the nation fairies Aww. SES and so Isu Man in the first couple of years demonstrates I can do this boy group that's going to take the nation by storm. Mm. I can take this girl group that's going to become the the nation's depio or, or, <laughs> or the fairies and it's just hit after hit from him. He really starts with this huge success. Yeah, SES were massive. I had a girl who was staying with us in London yeah. from Korea as like a student and she homestayed with us and she brought me an SES album and I had Ooh. no idea who they were. Yeah. But it was like this. It was really like pink and hazy and fairy-like and I was like, no, <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a man. I'm listening to US hip hop and stuff. Yeah. But the pictures were beautiful. The songs were really kind of lovey dovey ones. Yes, but yes. she told me in Korea, they are like everywhere. So I was like, oh, thank you yeah. for the CD. Not that I listened to it too much. Uh, what came next? Well, after, I mean, you would think having HOT, having SES mm. was enough. And yeah. I think it's really important just to remember how big these were at the time, especially just to say this that. There was no internet, so there was there was the television and the radio, and mm. many people were listening to the same thing. Yeah. So if you were big, mm. you were really big, yeah. and everybody knew about you. After that, Shinwa came. Now here you start getting. Now Shinwa were uh, originally they were a bit of a slow burner. They oh. had a few scandals at the start. Oh really? And some people said, you know, this is just a copy of HOT. That oh. was some of the criticisms. And I think this is really important and something that influenced Isu Man as he went on, that he couldn't just keep repeating the same thing. Sure. It needed it. Shinwa eventually became legends in their own right. They're, they're still going, right? They're one of the only, I think they might be the only yeah. first generation groups still going. They yeah. were there when it all kicked off and still there today. And during this 90s period, as it starts, SM Entertainment, Isu Man, they perfect the model for churning out acts that will get in the top 40s. They will pack concert halls. Mm. He demonstrated that he knows how to dominate the music business. And you would think that would be enough, but <laughs> it's not even the start of it. Pete. Yeah, that's maybe where he's done well, is not resting on those laurels, having like a successful girl group and boy band. Yeah, that would be enough for many agencies and concentrating on them. Yeah, I think that's what SM were good at in the early days compared to maybe the other agents keep on going and and there you have to remember just how much that keep on going is not just from Isu Man but it's from the artists themselves that training and mm. what they have to do what they have to go through the choreography the vocal training the how to speak Isu Man put that in like if you wanted to be in this stable yeah. in this group it was required that you work hard wow we must we must talk about Boa uh -huh. we must now she debuted Boa when she was 13, <laughs> she debuted in Korea and Japan at the same time. Mm. And so many Koreans actually thought she was Japanese. Oh, really? Absolutely. And she, it's, it's hard to tell how big Boa was again, but there you start seeing the international success, this Korea mm. and Japan. It's not just domestic, but we're going to release an artist now that's pan-Asian. It's, it's not global yet, but yeah. it's more pan-Asian across Asia. Isu Man has said that Boa basically saved SM Entertainment. Oh, wow. Because the first generation artists were coming to an end. Uh -huh. All their contracts were running out. Mm. It needed new artists to come in for the second generation. And Boa, her success, the money, the popularity that she brought in was just so helpful to help 
Isuman take from the first generation cross over to the second. Wow, I didn't know she had that kind of role. But in Japan at the time, she was huge. She was like number one. And I think a few Japanese people also thought she was Japanese. Like, such was her level of activities yeah. out there. Yeah. And absolutely. again, that same girl who introduced me to SES, she also talked about Boa and was like, she's 13, 14. I was like, what? She's yeah. like that young. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. And she was like top of the charts and everything. Unbelievable. I'm in London. I'm in Australia. Tokyo. The Philippines. Finland. Indonesia. New York. Arirang Radio. Radio. Now live in Seoul. I was speaking to Jay Chong. Jay Chong was the guy that introduced R&B to Korea Ooh, with the group Solid. Now, wow. they, they were huge here. Yes. When I was speaking to him, I said, Jay, you wrote a song for Boa. Oh, Um, I, the, I, I love it. The name has suddenly gone out of my brain. And I was like, what was it like working with her? What was that song like? Mm -hmm. And he was like, uh, I can't remember. I just remember she was really young. <laughs> and it was just amazing to speak to a music producer who's had all these number ones. And yes. he was like, I don't really remember that song, David. It was a busy time. Yeah. Like, wow. If you think of you know, your own work life, if you were asked about a project from like 20 years ago, you wouldn't remember. But we expect like celebrities and maybe film stars who've been in multiple works to remember everything. Yeah. They'd he, forget as well, wouldn't he's, they? His <laughs> one thing was just, wow, she was young, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that wasn't really a thing back then. That That young. No. It's not even... Well, these days a bit more, like with New Jeans and other groups, they have some younger teens in their ranks, but 13, yeah. And that's why maybe it's not really that new these days. Mm. I mean, you can go back to the Jackson 5, Donny Osmond, mm. or how, how old those people were when they were debuting. And, yeah. you know, Isu Man, was, he was doing that already. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Leon's back with some more info saying it is, I think, important also to talk about contract issues with SN Entertainment. They're known for it. It's kind of a dark part of their history. Uh, and like you mentioned, with the first generation idols coming to the end and Boa kind of saving the company, you know, maybe if they'd had a better relationship and contract talks had gone better, it wouldn't have been an issue. Perhaps, uh, yeah. we, that's coming oh. right up in the next part because that's second generation stuff, that's TVXQ uh -huh. and things like that. Maybe Rao's looking at this idea of Rao's HOT was superb, the first era, and then becomes in commercial music because that makes the money. And yeah, if, if you want to know something about SM, it's about making <laughs> money, Raoul. They do that. Yeah. And uh, Nian saying, Boa, yes, I actually heard her Japanese music before I ever heard her Ooh. Korean stuff. And I think in her early days, she was bigger in Japan, safe to say, than here in Korea. I might even suggest that BTS are bigger in Japan than they are in oh, Korea. Uh, because it's not always talked about, but BTS done like five Japanese language albums. <gasps> wow. And they're always top of the charts. Like all, a lot of their streaming revenue that yeah. comes from Japan. So we were talking about what are the similarities between HYBE and SM. That focus on the Japanese market mm. might be one. Yeah. Nian says that HYBE go out and purchase smaller record labels. SM is more focused on AI and internally. That's a really good point. That AI will come to that, uh, Nian. And Joshua got into K-pop in 2011 from Asian Friends. Everybody needs an Asian friend. <laughs> <laughs> you can get into K-pop and all the good stuff. Okay, so second generation, TVXQ. Yeah. When I came to Korea in 2008, they were pretty huge then, like Dongbangshin, TVXQ. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was a bit confused about those two names, but they were massive, right? Yeah. After, after debuting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've just realized that I didn't put a... Uh, Bang Shingi picture here. I don't know why. I'm sorry, but in 2003, this starts the second generation uh, for SM. They debut this five-member boy group, and this comes from the training system. And TVXQ, they had 13-year contracts. Now this is almost double oh the goodness. regular seven years. Yeah. So you can see. Um, Isu Man, he's learnt from this first generation. All the yeah. contracts are coming to an end. And he's like, okay, and now I have to renew them or pay more mm -hmm. or, or, or do whatever. And so the lesson that he tries to learn from the first to the second is maybe I need longer contracts. So that's what he starts with, wow. with TVXQ. It wasn't perhaps the, the best idea, but you also see tracks and the grace. They come out, but they don't really hit mm. it as much as they should until perhaps 2005 when you get... Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Super Junior. Now, wow. this is different from SM because now 13 members. Yeah. It's never done anything that big before. They also start hitting 
Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Latin America. And this, what's important here is having such a large group. Yeah. That was completely different. That was not a thing those days, right? Now you can see it from time to time and it's yeah. not so surprising. But back then, yeah, I was like, why are there so many of them? Uh, <laughs> and they're still going as well. That's another group like it's, Xinhua. Yeah, they're amazing. still going and still under SM, most of the artists. Uh, so maybe, yeah, he has learned from some of those past things. And you mentioned, yeah, they were more famous in places like Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Latin America. They did some, I think, Spanish songs as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so they now focus more on overseas, not just Japan and stuff, perhaps. So they do that. And what that brings with it is then some foreign members. Mm. Because, and I, I want to make clear again, just to the listeners, that all the things we associate with K-pop today, the training system, the long contracts, the... Um, regulations on behavior, the large groups, the yeah. young people. Like, Isuman was at the forefront of all this. He was a pioneer. He was mm. a vanguard. You know, he was working alongside other people in the industry. Sure. But he was there doing all this. Wow. And so you get foreign members come in. But let's talk about this golden period of SM entertainment. Mm. In 2008, 2000, sorry, 2007, 2008, and 2009, in those three years, we get three huge groups. The first being Girls' Generation. Oh, yes, they I come forget out. there's SM. 2007, <laughs> they become the nation's girl group. The, mm. And they're just so big. Lots the, of members they, as well. <laughs> girls' Generation were the biggest selling girl group in Korea and Japan for oh. more than 10 years. And Japan. Korea and Japan for more than 10 years. I mean, they wow. absolutely crushed it. All the members doing what SE, doing what SM does best. And mm. Yes. So that was 2007. Then 2008. 2008, you get Shiny. Oh, and and the, Shiny do something different, right? So Shiny was a break from the SM mold because mm. they bring in fashion and high-level performance. Uh -huh. So if you see the, the SES, the Girls' Generation, there's this kind of cute pop thing. Sure. But what Shiny are bringing in, they experimented with sound, aesthetic, and mm. performance. They didn't always fit the typical SM mode. And this was seen as, you know, a different change for them. Yeah, breaking out a little bit. That's cool. And then 2009, in the next year, you get FX. Oh, <laughs> I they mean, were very different. They were very different, particularly Amber, mm. maybe with that tomboy look yeah. and going on that. But what I love looking at these pictures that they're sort of 14, 15 years ago, and you're like, <laughs> well, if they debuted today, <laughs> it was, it's what have we seen change since then? Like, sure. It, it's very similar. Isu Man, those three years were just so incredibly important for SM. Yeah, wow. I, I, I totally forgot how many amazingly big popular artists they had across those, those years. SM Entertainment, though, you associate with Isu Man. Like, if yeah. you're a big fan here, you'll know it. But he actually stepped down relatively a long time ago now. Stepped down after those three groups. Wow. So he stepped down in 2010. He's the lug largest shareholder uh -huh. in SM Entertainment. Okay. And the reason, one of the reasons we're talking about this today is because Hybe and Kakao have mm. both been trying to buy the largest shares in SM Entertainment at Our the moment. Our listeners have been talking about that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's why we're trying to track back. I realise how much we're out of time, mm. but let's just do a name call so listeners just, just recognise yes. what SM have done. Yeah. So if you thought that was the golden period, 2012... You get XO, oh. you get the large groups, you get the uh, members from China. Mm. And this established a future strategy for the group. This is what they're going to go for. And you think, wow, they've done all of those artists. Surely that's enough. But no, it's not. 2013, coming up after that, you get Red Velvet. Red because they're pop. No. Velvet because they're R&B. Oh. They're perhaps best known these days for their trip to Pyongyang. Uh -huh. uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un is, is, is a fan. Oh, yeah, when we had good relations at that time. I remember they went for some concerts, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's Red Forgot Velvet. They're one of the only K-pop groups to have done that. Mm -hmm. And then after Red Velvet, you get NCT. And this was really important for Esper and other groups today, what NCT were doing. Mm. Because NCT, which stands for Neo Culture Technology, <laughs> Isu Man holds a press conference and he says, this is, this is the future. We're combining technology. Mm. We're combining science. And remember his master's degree, yeah. what he was doing. Computer science. NCT is a... 
unlimited. So there's unlimited members. There's mm. endless combinations, and they're going to go into NCT U, NCT One Two Seven, NCT Dream, and then like the Avengers, they can all come together. <laughs> and so there's these supergroups. There's these infinite possibilities combined with technology, and you know. We could keep going, Pete. Because after that, it goes to Super M. They were the first Korean act to hit number one on the Billboard 200 with a US debut. And then after that, you get Espa. It's just like SM is is absolutely amazing. You sometimes forget how influential they've been. Issa Man, mad props to you. Yeah, BTS kind of like overshadow everybody in a way. But in terms of being on the cutting edge with all these different concepts and stuff, it yeah. really does look like SM are good at not just... doing the same thing time and time again. I don't know, maybe I'm being uh, not accurate here, but for me, it seems like YG and JYP, they're kind of even similar today to what they were before in terms of their styles and, and stuff. And that's what makes them good. Yeah. The hip-hop and the 80s retro, mm. and that's what they're good at. But that's SM true. has been the thing that drives it, and uh, who knows where they'll go next. Yeah, looking forward to continuing to see what they do, even if they're bought out by this company or that. Uh, David, as ever, you've taught us so much. We'll see you again next month. Monday. Thank you very much. See you next Monday. You can listen to Monday's segment now and then with David Tizard every Monday from 10am KST on Hashtag Daily Cake.